Welcome to Epic Church Online. My name is Alan LaChapelle, and we've been covering the State of the Union Address to the Church. Jesus makes a State of the Union Address to His Church. It is imperative that we listen to what He says and we become doers of the Word. He's telling this for our purpose, our benefit. Now we've covered two churches so far in the book of Revelations. We covered the Ephesian church, which is the influential church. We've covered the church at Smyrna, which is the persecuted church. And today we're going to cover the third church. So let's go to our text in Revelation chapter 2. You want to go ahead and grab your Bible. Revelation chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 12. This is our third church. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp sword with the two edges, I, have, I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and you hold this fast my name, and has not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling, stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Verse 15, So has you all, thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. And will give him to a white stone, and in the stone a new name, written which no man knows, saving he that receives it. So here we have the third church, the church of Pergamos. And this is the church behind enemy lines. We're going to cover one verse today. And we're going to 30 cover that verse. So we're going to go back to verse 13. This is the church behind enemy line. So let's go read verse 13 again. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seed is. Thou holdest my name and has not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwells. The word dwelleth means permanent residence. He says it's the seat of Satan, and that word seat means throne, or a seat of authority, or a seat of power. So what he's literally saying, this is what Jesus is literally saying, he's saying in the city of Pergamos, the natural city of Pergamos, the devil, who is a spiritual entity, has his permanent residence in this natural city and he has a seat of authority he has his throne room there so he is making this city into his image after his likeness following his will that's pretty remarkable even in spite of that it says that there is a church there a church that's behind enemy lines even though Satan has a throne in this city, he has tremendous influence in this city. He's making this city after his image, after his likeness. He cannot stop the church of the Lord Jesus Christ from entering in to that place, to that stronghold. And we also see that Jesus makes a reference here to a gentleman that has given up his life for the faith. And, and, and that's not unusual that you're going to find a place where Satan has his dwelling, his permanent dwelling place, a, a place where he is in control, where he is, has a dominion, where he has tremendous influence, that you're going to find persecution for people of the light. You're going to see that. So the question is, how is it that a spiritual being, Satan, can have dominion, authority, permanent residency in a natural city. And how is it that he can do that after Jesus has died and raised from the dead 
and defeated him. Was that just an allegory? Was that just in theory? So let's find that out. Let's go and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna deal with that. Let's take this thing back all the way back before the age of man. Let's take this thing back to when there was one continent of heaven where the Father resided, where the Son resides, where the Spirit of God resides, where all of the angels reside. All the angels that were created by God to serve in the heavenly realm resided. There was one place, one God, one heaven. We'll say it's the continent of heaven. It's in the realm of the Spirit. Now the Bible speaks of heaven as above. But it's in the realm of the Spirit. So if you went above and above and above, hopped on a, hopped on a, a, a spacecraft and went into the heavens and you went above and above, you're not going to get into heaven. Because heaven is a realm of the Spirit. We're in the realm of the natural. It is the hidden realm. It's the hidden realm the hidden realm to us that are in the natural. If you were in the spiritual realm, it wouldn't be hidden at all. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't, it would, it would not be unvisible, it would be visible. Now we know that something happened in heaven from the Word of God. We know that Lucifer, who is now called Satan, the devil, rebelled against God. He wasn't happy with his position. And iniquity was found in him, sin was found in him. Well, there is no sin in heaven. There is no sin in God. There is no sin in Jesus. There is no sin in, in the Holy Ghost. There is no sin in that realm. So what it's separated between Satan and he took one third of the angelic beings with him in this rebellion and they were cast down. See, the Bible says that hell is from beneath, awaits thee at thy coming. Hell is described as beneath, but it's not in the natural. So if he went beneath into the earth, and you went, and you went, and you went down, 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 and you're in the natural realm, you're not going to run into the spirit realm. Because it's the realm of the spirit. We live in the realm of the natural. So now we have two continents. We have the continent of heaven and the continent of hell. And they are spiritual realms. They are in the realm of the spirit. Satan is a spiritual being. He's not a natural being. He is a spiritual being that's been cast down into the realm of the Spirit. Cast down from above. Heaven is above. Hell is below. God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the angels that did not rebel are in heaven. Satan is in hell, in the realm of the Spirit, and those that followed him, separated from God. Hell is basically the separation from God. Everything that God is, which is goodness, love, joy, peace, all of that is in the realm of heaven, in the continent of heaven. And hell is the separation from God, from all that goodness. Let's move it forward now. Now we have the age of men, found in Genesis chapter 1, that God creates man in his image after his likeness. Now man is created first and foremost in the realm of the natural because God creates a body for him. But it's not active, it's not alive until he breathes into him. And what does he breathe? He breathes his essence into him. God is a spiritual being and he breathes his spirit into man. And man becomes alive, a living soul. And God says, I give you dominion over everything that I've created in this earth. Every living thing in this earth is under your dominion. You are the Lord of this earth. I give you that. He delegates authority to man to manage the world and every creature, whether it swims, whether it flies, whether it crawls, whether it walks. He had dominion over all of it to form it into the image of God as he grew in fellowship with the Lord. Well, we know what, what happened there. We know that there was a deception that came. There was a deceiver that came. Now, before the fall and after the fall, there is a huge difference between what Satan could do and what he couldn't do. Before man fell from his position, from his place, before, before man fell, 
Satan did not have, he was not the god of this world. He did not have authority. He wasn't called the prince of the power of the air or air waves or the ability to go into the minds of men and plant thoughts, his thoughts, his will, his desires into the thoughts of men to lead them down his desired path. He didn't have that ability. He had to go in and use an animal to speak through, to bring his deception to man. Now understand that Jesus, or the Word the word of God tells us that God gave man dominion. When he gives him dominion, he doesn't take it back. He gave him dominion over everything on the earth. So when there is an animal or anything that got out of line, Adam and Eve had the authority to speak to that and banish it. It was an animal. It needed to stay in line, and Adam and Eve had the ability to banish it. To say, shut up and move on out. But they chose not to do that. They chose to listen to the lie instead of listening to their Lord, to their Father, to their God, to their Creator. And what did that do? It created a rift immediately. Sin came into the world and sin came into man. Sin came into the world, sin came into man. And the devastation of that event is felt today. And the devastation of that result is in the thoughts of a man, in human terms, is hopeless. In human terms, what happened there when man fell, he fell from eternity into time. Chronos time, chronological time, linear time. And we know that's true. You're born, you die. It's a straight line. You're born, guess what? You die. Same thing with mankind. Mankind had a start. He was born into it. There's a straight line that's going to come. It's going to end. He dies. The age of man will begin. The age of man will end because of linear time, because of chronological time, he fell into it, because he disobeyed. It wasn't God's perfect will, it wasn't God's desire for that to happen, but it happened. And in the vantage point of a man, that has no, there is no ability for mankind to get himself out of that. See, there's nobody on the earth that is holy because it's all been tarnished. Every seed of man has been tarnished with that sin element. There is no man that's smart enough, strong enough, holy enough to fix it. Not one. Not one. Anybody that's born of a woman from this earth does not have the ability to fix the problem of separation between mankind and God. It's called spiritual death. So when the Bible speaks of spiritual death, it's not speaking of non-existence. It's speaking of separation, spiritual separation. It is not fixable in the eyes of man. It is not fixable with mankind. There's a second problem that happened. God delegated authority to man. Man released his authority to the devil. And the devil took great advantage of that, became the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air, with the influence, the ability to influence mankind and his thoughts in the soulless realm, so that he can form and make the earth after his kind, after his desires, after his will. And he's been going like gangbusters ever since. I mean, it got so bad that it, the god had to cause a flood to come upon the earth to destroy the wickedness that had infiltrated the earth almost to the point where every seed would have been corrupted and Jesus could not have come. And the harshness that the Israelites dealt with, the people that they took over from the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, the harshness that they dealt with is because of the issue of sin in this world. So. Two things, Satan, the rogue element, spiritual element in this world, was now the god of this world. Mankind, 
allowed him to do that. It needed to be a man that changed that. But there is no man found that can do that. There's no man born in this world that can change that. Spiritual separation because of sin, it had to be, it was done by a man. It had to be fixed by mankind. But there is no man that can fix it. There is no man born of a woman from this earth that could fix it. Muhammad can't fix it. Confucius can't fix it. The Dalai Lama can't fix it. Buddha can't fix it. Great philosophers, great men, great women of God, they cannot fix it. It's not fixable by man. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. In the viewpoint of a man, it is hopeless. See, people don't understand the depth of the problem. So that's why they don't really understand the amazing solution because they don't understand the depth of the problem. The depth of the problem, in, the, in man's eyes, is absolutely hopeless. But God had a plan. And his name is Jesus. Let me tell you that Jesus is the center of the universe. Jesus is the center of the universe. He shares that universe with no one. He is the center of it. And if you want to be in the center of that universe, then you need to be in the center of him. He needs to be the center of your universe. He's the only solution to the problem. See, God had a plan right off the bat when that happened. He had to send himself. Because it was only God that can fix that. Only one that is holy and pure can fix that. Only one that is from the heavens can fix that. There's no man born from this earth that can fix that. Only a man that came from heaven can fix that. And that came in the form of his son. It cost him. It cost God his son. It cost him. Jesus, it cost him. He had to leave the realm of the heaven. He had to leave the presence, the direct presence of his father. He had to leave that. He had to leave the powers that he had to transform, to create. He had to leave that behind. And then he had to be made into flesh, a man. And he had to be born as a baby. And he had to learn about the things of this world and grow in wisdom and understanding for natural things, for mental things, and for spiritual things, just like a man. And that's exactly what he did. And he came and he walked on this earth and he walked into his ministry and he began to teach about heaven because he knows where heaven is and he'd been there. And he began to teach and preach, began to deliver, began to heal, began to demonstrate the goodness of God, began to raise people from the dead. And then ultimately he knew that he would have to lay his, down, his life down for mankind so that the curse of sin would be forever satisfied, and he willingly did that. He willingly did that. He didn't do that for him. He did it for, for me. He did it for you. He laid his life down willingly for you and for me. But then he said something else. I'm going to take it back up again. And that's exactly what he did. It's exactly what he did. He took it back up again. Now, the question is this. How can Satan, who is a spiritual being, have dominion, authority, permanent residence in a natural place? How does he do that? And was he not defeated by Jesus? Well, let's start with that one. So let's go. We're going to... We're going to find that spot. Let's find that in, in Scripture. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. If you have your Bible, Colossians chapter 2. Let's start reading at verse, I believe it's 15. And this is what the word says. And having spoiled principalities and powers, 
he made a show of them openly, tri triumphing over them in it. Let me read that again. And having spoiled, let's go start at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Well, if you, if you look at that, that actually is a description of what happens when, in this time frame, when this was written, of what a king that had conquered another king or another kingdom. A king that had conquered another king would take that king that had been conquered, would take his eyes out, would bind his arms with a rope, and he would be dragged behind a chariot, a horse, paraded through the city that has been conquered, and stripped naked. Humiliated, conquered, creating a fear with the people knowing that their king, the one they looked up to, has been completely, thoroughly defeated and humiliated. That's the description that's here. It says that Jesus did that with the principalities and the powers, which, is, which would be bound in Satan. He had done that to them. He paraded them. This is your king. He has been conquered thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly. So the conquering of Satan by Jesus is thorough. It's not just an allegory. It's not just in theory. It is actual. It is actual. Let's go to Revelation 1. Revelation 1, 18. Revelation 1, 18 says this. I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Now listen to what Jesus says. He says, I am he that's living. I'm alive right now, speaking to you. I was dead. I did go to the cross, but I did it on purpose. I willingly allowed it to happen. And I live forevermore. I was resurrected to eternity. And when I did that, I took the keys of hell, and I took the keys of death. The death he's speaking of is spiritual death. Till Jesus resurrected, there was no man that could go to heaven. The devil had those keys. There was no man that could go to heaven. Abraham couldn't go to heaven. Isaac couldn't go to heaven. David couldn't go to heaven. The prophets couldn't go to heaven. They had no ability to go to heaven because sin was still there. They needed Jesus. They needed Jesus to conquer. And he did. And he took captivity captive. He took captivity captive. See, now the keys are in Jesus' hand to hell and spiritual death. And so no man, no man has to go. No man, because Jesus has those keys. And all you have to do is believe on him, believe that he died for your sins, believe that he was raised for the, from the dead for your justification so that you may be right with God or positioned in God through Jesus, and you have eternal life. He's got those keys. The devil doesn't have those keys. Jesus has those keys. Jesus has those keys. Not the devil. Let's look at 1 Peter 5.8. 1 Peter. We're going back. Or excuse me, we're going forward. This is, this is the admonition that Peter has for the church. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom may, he may devour. Now that's after Jesus is resurrected, yet he's still around. He's still around. Why is he still around? Well, he's lost the ability to keep people in hell. He's lost the ability to keep people away from God. He's lost that ability. All he can do is lie to you and tell you that, and you believe the lie, or you can resist the lie, which is this is what he's talking about, and receive the truth that you can believe on Jesus and you have eternal life. 
I believe on Jesus and I have eternal life, not because of anything that I've done, but because of everything he's done. And I believe what he says. See, that's the key. I need to believe what he says. That's why he wrote the book. He wrote a book. It's a bestseller. The reason he wrote the book and it's a bestseller is because he wants you to know the truth. The devil doesn't want you to know the truth, but God wants you to know the truth, that Jesus came and died for you and believe on him and you have eternal life and then become a follower of him. So you don't just believe and then stop. Believe so that you may follow him. How long do you follow him? Forever. As long as you have breath in this body, you follow him. You grow in him. You grow in the knowledge of who he is. You grow in the knowledge of the love of the Father. You continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. You grow. But Satan still remains. See, Satan is not put in... He's still in hell. He still has access to this earth because he's not been put in the lake of fire yet. When he's put in the lake of fire, he will have no ability to deceive mankind ever again. But that time is not yet. That time is not yet. Now what about Jesus? What about Jesus? You don't hear scripture saying that Jesus has a stronghold on the earth. Why is that? Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 13. Let's start, yeah, verse 13. But to which of the angels says he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? God tells Jesus, you sit here on my right hand, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. In other words, there's a time that needs to be set that's not yet done, and you stay right here on my right hand. Let's go to Acts chapter 3, 21. Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive, talking about Jesus, until the time of restitution or reconstruction of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began, whom the heaven must receive or hold or keep until the time of restitution of all things. See, Jesus has appointed, God has appointed Jesus for a certain time in the same way that it was the fullness of time when he came. It was the fullness of time when the seed was implanted in the woman. It was the fullness of time when he was born of a woman. It was the fullness of time when he grew into his ministry. It was a fullness of time when he went to the cross. It was a fullness of time when he was resurrected. It will be the fullness of time when he comes for his church. It will be the fullness of time when he comes back and begins his 1,000 year reign on planet Earth. It's in God's timing, not our timing. It's his fullness of time. And that time has not yet appeared. Now we need to look at salvation in, in a, in a three-part timing. Jesus purchased all of salvation for us. There's nothing missing. But a yet is not all now. There's a timing. There is a past in salvation. There's a present in salvation. And there's a future in salvation. The past of salvation is this, what we have been speaking about. Jesus came, put on flesh. Jesus walked among men. Jesus preached of the kingdom of heaven, the heavenly spiritual realm, not the earthly spiritual realm, not the one from beneath, but from the heavenly realm. And Jesus taught, Jesus healed, Jesus delivered, he manifested the kingdom to the people. Jesus laid his life down because he knew that's what had to happen in order for there to be more than just him. In order for people to be in heaven, there had to be a substitute that paid the price for the sin. And he willingly did that. And when we believe on him, we receive his life, eternal life. We're hidden in him. God sees the blood of Jesus covering us, enter in, we have eternal life. He rose again. Everything had been is completed. He purchased it all to know who we are in Christ. 
That was done in the past. We can walk in that today. The next thing is today. Salvation for today. And that involves your soul. And your soul is your will, your emotions, your intellect. See, that needs to be renewed day by day. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is our responsibility. That's not God's responsibility. That's our responsibility. To take what's been done in the past and then put in our spirit when we believe on it and renew our mind with the Word of God so that our, our soulish realm, our will, our emotions, our intellect line up with what's inside of us in our spirit man. See, that's why we have so many baby Christians. That's why we have so many Christians that don't make the gospel look good because they've been born again in the spirit but they've never grown up. So their soulish realm, their will, their emotions, their intellect don't line up with what's inside of them. And that's a day-to-day -day salvation. But we're, we have three parts, don't we? We have a flesh, we have a body. And unfortunately this body is of this world and this world has a sin problem, this world has a sin nature or a sin principle in it. And because this body is still of this world, it has a sin principle in it. See, your biggest problem is not the devil. Your biggest problem is your flesh that wants to do what it wants to do. And it doesn't want to do what God wants to do. It wants to do what the God of this world generally wants to do and what you want, what makes you comfortable, what makes you happy. And that is something that's going to happen in the future because the Bible says one day you're going to have a new body you're going to have a body that's removed from this sin nature that's in it. It's not going to have the influence of the devil, and it's not going to have a sin nature to, to sin in it. But while we remain and wait for that hope, that's a hope that Jesus is coming for us. Jesus come for his church to transform us, to give us a new glorified body like his body. We need to be diligent. We need to be diligent in reading the Word of God. We need to be diligent in praying, and we need to be diligent in meditating the Word so that we can transform the way we think and line our thinking up to what the Word of God is and line our thinking up with what our spirit man is all about and so that we can also control our flesh, much better control our flesh to do the things of God. Till next week, God bless you.